Welcome everyone to the School of Greatness podcast. I'm with my dear friend Marie Forleo. How's it going? Amazing. I'm so happy to have you here in yeah, our studio. I know. I'm, you've been here for what, a year now? A little bit over a year uh -huh. and we're so happy about it. Yeah, I think I came in one of the first months you were getting ready. We had a little meeting here and it's come a long way. Obviously all your videos are incredible in this space. Thank you. So first I want to just say congratulations for all your success. I've known you for I think four years now, is that right? Something like that. 2010 maybe, 2011, and uh, I've s we've, we've hung out a bunch along the journey and I've seen the growth you've had and it's just incredible and so inspiring and you deserve it. It's been amazing to watch your growth and to see how many people you're serving and inspiring and all the success stories that are coming from the work you're doing. So first, congrats. Thank you so much, that's yeah, so sweet. It's so cool. And obviously I'm in your, your uh, B-School community, so I see the comments and the feedback that all of the members have when they're seeing their own success. Yeah. So it's just so much fun and you're doing great work. Um, I wanna talk about how you actually got to where you are now because this isn't what you used to do back in the day. You used to be, uh, I guess on the New York Stock Exchange floor, right? Yes. And then you were a bartender as well, I think during or after that period. Yes. And you were a fitness dance instructor. Yes. And probably doing a number of other things. Uh, did you ever imagine earlier in your career that you'd be where you are now? I think there was glimmers of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was on the New York Stock Exchange, it was an amazing environment. You know, there's no seats on the floor and you're running around like a crazy person all day, which is great <laughs> for me because I had a lot of energy. Yeah. But I realized, you know, no matter how many millions people were making around me, they seemed and they shared that they felt spiritually bankrupt. Mm. And I just couldn't envision myself going to the same place every single day and living for like those two weeks a year when you could take vacation. Yeah. Just felt like a mismatch for my DNA. Mm. Um, so I knew I was meant to do something that was different. I knew that I wanted to make a positive impact on a lot of people's lives. I knew I wanted to travel. I had a sense that I wanted to teach somehow, mm. but I couldn't have imagined this because I don't think I even knew this could exist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, back then there wasn't even the internet probably, or nope. there was, no one was not, really doing this. Not at this level. And yeah. you know, after I left Wall Street, and I was going on my odyssey to figure out what I was supposed to do with my life. And I worked in magazine publishing because I thought mm. that that would be a good mix for me because I loved business, but I was also really creative. As a little girl, I would draw and paint all the time. Mm. And I thought I was either gonna be an animator for Disney or a fashion really? designer. Was yes. that your dream as a child? I had. I was a multi-passionate kid. Uh -huh. So when I look back at those kid books, my mom kept like really great records. And it says, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would answer at six with like, five or six different professions from like, so I wanted to be an artist and mm. a dancer and an actress and a writer and a teacher. There was always a million things. And you've done all those things. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like, right? Yeah, but I even remember <laughs> as a kid, I was like, gosh, choosing one thing sounds so boring. And mm. I know it's great for some people because that's their truth. But for me, there was always a lot happening. So even mm. in the magazine publishing world, um, it was awesome and I'm so grateful for that experience. But I kept having that feeling that I think many of us have this is not where I'm supposed to be. Huh. This is not where, what I'm meant to do. And I would look ahead at my bosses, you know, the publisher of a magazine, the editor in chief of a magazine, and I would see that path and I said, gosh, I don't want to be them. I'm mm -hmm. not aspiring to get that job. So if I don't want to climb this ladder, what am I doing here? Like yeah. I'm wasting my time and their time. And it started to really gnaw at me because I felt I had so much potential and it felt like time was passing me by. And again, I was all of like 21 years old. Sure. But at that point, I was like, you know, a racehorse ready to get out of the gate. And I just yeah. felt like I couldn't get traction. I felt like a loser, to be honest with you, because I knew I was smart. I knew I was driven. I knew I was ready to work hard, but I felt like I couldn't figure out where my place was. Mm. So it's interesting to talk about that you weren't uh, feeling like you were living your passion. You could see like you didn't want to do this ladder thing for 10, 20 years to get to a certain position. And I get those emails and questions all the time from people or that sense from people that are like not fully fulfilled with what they're doing. Yeah. So how does someone take the steps to figuring out what it is they're really passionate about and take those steps to start doing it so they can make a full-time living doing what they love? What do you think some things people can do? My favorite life mantra that I live by is that clarity comes from engagement, not thought. I remember being in those jobs, trying to think my way into what I was supposed to be doing with my life. 
And at that time, the internet was, again, just kind of new. Yeah. And one day I was at Mademoiselle and I was searching around online and I stumbled upon this article about a new profession at the time called life coaching. Uh -huh. And I say new at the time because now it seems like everybody- Everyone's a life coach. Everybody's a life coach. Yeah. Um, but I couldn't deny how something in my body and in my soul seemed mm. to light up. And the more I learned about it, the more I got lit up. Mm. And so I researched and I found this place called Coach University, and it was the first online coach training. So they teach you to be a business coach and a life coach, and it was three years. Wow. You do it all over teleseminars. And again, this all sounded brand new sure. <laughs> back in the <laughs> late 90s. Um, You're like, is this a scam? What yeah. is this tell us thing? <laughs> it sounded so cool and I really yeah, trusted yeah. the article that I read. And again, after I researched it, I'm like, this sounds amazing. Wow. It sounds like a good fit for me. So I signed up and I continued my job at the magazine during the day. But my point here is I did something. Mm. You know, I got that article and I was like, wow, that inspired me. Let me go call the coach training place and check out what that is. Oh, mm -hmm. let me go sign up and see what this is like. And out of the act of doing it, out of engaging, I kept getting the signals that this is this is for me. And I think that so many of us can think in our minds like, okay, I'm dissatisfied, I'm, I'm not fulfilled, I don't know what I wanna do, but we try and think our way into an answer rather than start getting into yeah. action to try different things, to sample them. Yeah. You can take a class, you can take a physical class, you can read a book, you can start talking to people. There are so many different strategic ways to engage in an idea without quitting your job, without putting yourself at risk, um, without doing anything that would jeopardize your well-being in the yeah. current moment, but set yourself up for success, you know, down the line. Yeah, interesting. What do you think is, um, you know, you, you weren't this huge success overnight once you started life coaching. You know, it took you three years to become certified, I guess, right? Yes. And then you started- And I didn't even become certified. Okay. I graduated, I finished all of my um, courses, but then there was this whole other certification process. <laughs> and to be really honest, I just, I was didn't feel called to do it. Mm -hmm. I had other things by that point that I was like, okay, I wanna get a product out there. I also got yeah. involved with health and fitness. So there was only 24 hours in a day and I just, I chose not to get certified because it didn't feel yeah. like I needed to. And you could pick up clients along the way anyways. You don't need oh. to be certified to coach people. And I was more interested in, could I get someone results? Exactly. Was I a good coach? Yeah. Could I positively impact their life? Could right. I help them get to the place where they wanted to go? And could I be an awesome coach again from experience, not just because I had a piece of paper? Yeah. So that for me was more exciting and mm. that's what I focused on. What do you think people need to do in their thought process, in the approach, in learning about that it's a journey? Because obviously, again, you didn't have clients overnight. You weren't this big success then that you are now with Marie TV and B School and all the things you've been up to. It's been a journey. It's been like a 10, Long, 12, yes. seven year journey, right? Absolutely. To get to where you are now. Yeah. And people want the results now. They want to be rich, they want to be healthy, they want to be you know wealthy in all the sense right now. Yes. How can people start approaching things differently to be, to dream big, but also be realistic? Yeah, I think that there is a mindset that I adopted, thankfully, um, in my early 20s that really saved my butt and that I think it can really help most people because I'm a driven individual. Yeah. I'm incredibly ambitious. Yeah. And you know, most people in our day and age, there is that bit of wanting instant gratification, mm -hmm. but I think that it sets us up to be unhappy. Mm. And so for me, I often wrestled with, okay, well, how do I reconcile the fact that I have big dreams, I'm not where I wanna be yet, yet I don't wanna be miserable until I get there because I'm smart <laughs> enough right. to know that when I get there, my <laughs> dreams are actually gonna get bigger, yeah. so I'm just setting myself up for a life of misery. Yeah. Thank <laughs> goodness I discovered this whole kind of philosophy of living in the moment and it was really a set mm. of practices and I learned how to get out of my head and really live in the here and now and not by sitting on some mountaintop or oming all day but to really engage in the present moment like this moment is it this is it and I call it uh, in the book that I wrote making isness your business like whatever is happening in this moment mm. I'm gonna just approach it and attack it like I'm meant to be here this is my party, no matter what's going on. If I'm bartending and I'm working seven days a week, if I'm scrubbing somebody's floor, which I did, I mean, I was a personal assistant, I cleaned people's toilets, I did whatever I needed to do because I didn't want to be a desperate life coach because I thought yeah. that's like the most horrible thing in the world, <laughs> needing paying clients. I said, let me make money 
bartending and cleaning people's toilets or doing whatever I have to do so that when I'm coaching people, I can coach them out of my skill set and my desire to make a difference, not out of needing mm. their money. Mm. So this idea <coughs> of making isness your business trains you to love this moment but you're also super pumped about where you're going. Yeah. So it's not like you lose sight of your dreams. It's not like you lose your ambition, but you strike this really interesting balance of being fully here and now and fully excited about where you're going. And That's I think so that saved me. Yeah, I think it's kind of like being in a dance of like living in the now, but also aspiring for the future of what you really want, which could be Yes. In a year, or 10 years, or whatever it may be, right? Yeah. And I just did an interview with a guy named Donald Schultz who said something that goes like, there are only two days a year you can't work, and it's yesterday and tomorrow. <laughs> and I thought it was interesting when he said that. I was like, yeah, you've really got to be present. Obviously, you can dream about tomorrow yep. and dream about your vision and what you want to create and plan for the future. Yep. But it's, you've got to be present in today's journey. Yes. And appreciate what you do have, not what you don't have, right? Absolutely, and anywhere you find yourself, it is up to you whether or not you're gonna be miserable there mm. or you're gonna make it awesome. You know, and I remember so many times going into another bartending shift, and of course, if I let my <laughs> mind run wild, my mind would say, what are you still doing here? Mm. If you were smarter, you would have you know, a full business by now. When is this ever gonna happen? And I really trained myself to go, whatever, I'm here right now, how can I make the best drink possible? How yeah. can I have so much fun with all the people that I'm working with? How can I give these people a great experience so that at the end of my shift, I'm not exhausted from being miserable yeah. for six right? hours. Yeah. And I can actually go home, yeah, a little bit tired, but not feeling like I'm wrong in my life. Or I'm worthless. Or, or yeah. I'm not talented enough, or mm -hmm. I'm not smart enough. And it was a really great training period you know, people often ask, they're like, are you really always this happy? And I'm like, I'm not always happy, but I'm a damn happy person yeah. most of the time. And I yeah. have my bad days, but I really think so much of success is about your attitude that you bring to the table. Yeah. And you've got to bring it to the table every single day, no matter what stage you're at. And for me, I didn't fully transition into my full-time business. I think like, most people don't know this, like seven years. Wow. So when people tell me like, oh, I have this day job and I'm so miserable, I'm like. Seven years until you're doing what you've been doing now. Kind of. Yeah. So, you know, there was a whole period, again, this multi-passionate thing. Of course. When I was starting my coaching practice, I started to recognize that even just calling myself a coach felt limited. Mm. And I had this dream of dancing and I love hip hop. Yeah. Never had any formal training in the world. I also love fitness. Um, so there's a lot of things that I wanted to get involved with and I realized when I was about 25 I said if I don't do all of these things right now, I'm gonna regret it. I mm. realized that if I take some attention away from coaching, sure I won't get there as fast as I would have if I put all my attention there, but it's not my truth. Yeah. The truth is I want to dance hip-hop. Yeah. I want to go do some cool things out on the road. Right. I don't care if I'm not making a ton of money or not this quote-unquote famous person. I didn't care at all about that. Yeah. What mattered to me was am I living the life that I want to live? Mm, I love that. I want to talk about uh, mastering the things that you don't like doing along the journey, like mastering the perfect drink or bartending that shift, like just becoming a master. Because I remember doing some jobs, I'm sure we all had jobs we don't love. Yep. I used to be a truck driver for about three months until I couldn't do it anymore. But I would try to master timing, getting to my location and then getting back and as quick as possible and master like the roads and everything was about mastery for yep. me, even in those little things that I didn't like. Yep. Why is it so important to try to master the things even though we don't like or we're not fully passionate about along the way? Why do you feel like that's important? I think it's all about quality of life, right? Mm. You take you wherever you go. And if in those moments you're doing a job that you're not really excited about, but you have to be there for eight hours, you have a choice. You're yeah. either going to be miserable for eight hours mm -hmm. or you're going to engage like a champ. Right. And you're going to show up and be amazing. And I got to tell you, so many opportunities for me have come from me training myself to show up like a champ wherever I was. So for example, you know, I taught hip hop at Crunch. And did I think I was gonna teach hip hop forever? No, but I wanted to be the best hip hop instructor I possibly could be while I was there. Yeah. And because my classes were filled and because uh, I taught a good class, the higher ups chose me to be uh, someone who auditioned for Nike, mm. you know, and gave me this opportunity. Yeah. And then I got to be a Nike elite trainer and travel to Europe and all over the place. That's and weren't you the first one or? I was one of the first, the first four. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, even when I was bartending in college, because I would do such a good job on this one person's cappuccino, that's how I got my job on the floor of 
Wall Street. Wow, really? It really, because they were like, you care so much about what wow. you're doing. Like, what do you want to do after you graduate? They knew I was a college student. I said, no, I'm a finance major. I can't see myself in corporate finance. I can't see myself at a desk, but I don't know what else to do. And they're like, you know what? My brother works on the floor. Give huh. me a resume. So for me, this idea of mastery and showing up like just you own it, the opportunities that can come when you do that, you can't even predict, mm. not to mention how you train yourself as a human being in terms of your own happiness and your own yeah. fulfillment. When you show up with that attitude of, I'm gonna master this, I'm gonna bring my A game, you feel better, you have more energy. The results are gonna be better. You'll yeah. leave your day feeling just incredible rather than miserable. Yeah, that's great. Gratitude is something that I'm a big proponent of, yes. and I know you are as well. Can you speak about the power of gratitude and how it affects everything in our lives? I think it's the most incredible transformational tool that there mm. is because if we're still alive, we have something to be grateful for. You know, all of us have challenging times in our life. Things go wrong. Everything hits the fan. We all feel like failures. We feel frustrated. Nothing's going our way. We should probably give up. Why are we even here? I don't think there's any human being on the planet that doesn't have those days, and yeah. I have them too, where you yeah. just wake up and you're like, goodness, what is going <laughs> on? How did yeah. all this happen? And for me, it's the first thing that I go to to start to turn that around internally and ask myself, okay, mm. you know what? I feel like crap right now. I want to cry. Everything sucks, but I'm still breathing. I look around. I'm like, okay, roof over my head. If yeah. I went to the fridge, there's food in the fridge. Mm. And I know because of so much of the work that we do that there are millions, in fact, a billion people that don't have those basic things, yeah. that can't say they have a safe roof over their head, that don't have food in a refrigerator. They don't even have running water. Yeah. So for me, it's a really great check immediately mm. to say, okay, great. I feel like crap, but I got all these things. How can I start to turn this around? Yeah. And then I go to one of my other favorites, which is everything is figure outable yeah. that I learned Don't from my mom. Don't you have that on the wall over here or something? Uh, yeah, or we'll, yeah. Get a, we'll get a <laughs> shot of that. I do because it's, it's, you know, when you're in a tough spot, what matters is your beliefs and your psychology and what you're going to do in that moment, yeah. no matter what the circumstances are. And for me, that gratitude piece is first because it starts to shift everything. Mm -hmm. And then going to everything is figure outable, which is my belief helps me get into problem solving mode yeah. and go, okay, whatever the situation is, what do I need to do? What actions do I need to take? Do I need to pick up a phone? Do I need to go out and exercise? Do I need to put on some music? Do I need to just sit and cry? Like, what do I need mm -hmm. to do to move myself ahead in a positive, powerful way? What's your daily routine like then? Do you wake up and express gratitude? Are you meditating? Are, yeah. you, are you expressing gratitude throughout the day? You know, what's What's, what's it like? Are you working out mentally, emotionally? What's your what's your plan every day? So um, there's a couple things that I always make sure that I do. But again, I'm someone who, ironically, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a paradox in this sense where I love structure. And you know, Josh, my fiance, he makes fun of me. He's like, "You're the most organized, structured person I've ever met." And I rebel against you it. You want flexibility at too. the it's same freedom. time, yeah. completely. <laughs> so um, meditation always happens, whether mm -hmm. it happens first, second, or third, depends on how I feel. You know, do I need my little cup of mate when I wake up first? Sure. Do I need water when I wake up first? Do I just need to like chill for a second when uh -huh. I wake up first? Um, green juice is another thing that's always fit in there. Yeah. And then exercise is really, that always depends on the flow. Like depending on what's happening with myself and my business and my creativity, sometimes it happens in the morning. That's always the ideal time. But there's often times when it doesn't, yeah. you know, and it has to either get shifted a little bit later or like, you know, later on this week, I'm going to this uh, like super early morning dance party from yeah. like 6 a.m. Yeah. to 9 a.m. Uh -huh. And I'm like, this is awesome. So I try and change it up. But the meditation and the green juice and just getting myself really centered and ready for the mm. day, that's what I do. And then in terms of productivity, though, the night before, I always make my list for the next day. Really? Oh, my goodness. Because... My schedule is such that there's so much variety. So there could be interviews, there could be phone yeah. calls, it could be travel, there could be shoots. And if I don't get myself set up the night before, I don't feel like I can dive right into the day with strength and clarity. So I look at all the things that are happening, if there's any outside appointments and all of my tasks, like the important yeah. things that need to get done, those are listed first and then the time is blocked out and then the rest of the day can be awesome. So would you say setting an intention the night before is really powerful and setting yourself up to win that day? Yeah, and for me it's not so much of an intention because I think my DNA is such that I wanna just 
murder it. Yeah, and yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I'm going to just gonna crush happen. this. Yeah. It's going to happen. <laughs> and I'm going to have a good time. But for me, it's actual clarity of like, what are the most important things that need uh -huh. to get done? And what are the things that would be great, but if for whatever reason, life shows up or things have to get mm -hmm. moved around, they can move on. Yeah, I think I saw a video of you talking about important and urgent and to actually focus on doing the important things first. Always. Always first, and then get to the urgent things later, because the urgent things will always. They'll always get done. Right. Because if they're really that urgent, you will we'll take care of them. You will, but yeah. uh, you know, in our digital age of so much information coming at mm -hmm. us constantly, and the way that most of us have habituated ourselves to have our phones ding, to have little alerts come up, yeah. to have everything come in, that we trained ourselves to like, you know, hit the refresh button on our email like a little crack addict. Instagram. And oh my, <laughs> it's like, it's insane. But yeah. we've done this to ourselves and we have to yeah. systematically undo it mm -hmm. if we want to actually move the ball ahead on major projects. So how do we start undoing these things, these habits that aren't serving us or that aren't really moving us forward to achieving our visions? You know, I think awareness is the first step to mm. any major change. And so you just gotta get real with yourself about yeah. your crappy habits. Yeah. You know what I mean? And be honest about, yeah, I just spent two to three hours getting sucked into Facebook and comparing <laughs> myself to everyone else and looking at, oh my God, they're doing so much better than I am. And what about this? And yeah. I think being honest with yourself and awareness of what you're doing that's not working so that you can replace it with a habit that does. And I mean, that simple practice, mm. if anyone just at the end of their workday sat down and took a look at, okay, what's the most important things I need to get done tomorrow and actually time blocked it, like, okay, Scheduled writing that in. blog, it, even like writing that blog post is probably gonna take me 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, that's on there. Having a meeting with the team, that's at least another 30 minutes. Writing this brand new whatever, that's an hour. Mm. All of a sudden, you'll see your morning is like pretty spoken for. Yeah. You should not be going to email. You should not be taking phone calls and you shouldn't do anything else but those important things. Mm. Yeah. I'm a big fan of coaches yes. and mentors. Yes. And I feel like my entire athletic career would not have been the way it was without having great coaches. And my years or seasons, I should say, reflected the coaches I had. If really? I had great coaches, I typically had a great performance or I felt great. Yep. When I had coaches that were negative, it was really weighing on me and the results were not as powerful. Mm -hmm. Who have been your mentors or coaches or influential people along your, your lifetime? And growing up, I should say, and then who are your mentors and coaches now? You know, growing up, I had some influential people. My parents mm -hmm. are amazing human beings. Yeah. I remember when I was in high school and I was on the cheerleading team, which by the way, I tried out to be a cheerleader, I think, I don't know how many years and I got rejected. Really? All of them. Oh yeah, um. I sucked. <laughs> I was horrible, but I kept at it until they finally said yes. And wow. you know, I figured out what I was doing wrong and got in. And then I went right to being captain. So it, it paid nice. off. Nice. <laughs> and I remember that my cheerleading coach in high school, she saw how hard I was willing to work. Mm. And it really impressed me because she said, you know what, the other girls in the team probably aren't going to like this decision that I move you up to captain. Wow. But no one else, I created a whole kind of fitness circuit so everyone could get strong so we could hopefully win a competition. Yeah. And I would do a lot of the choreography for the team because I love to dance. And so that was really important for me when she rewarded me based on my work and my work ethic and what I was bringing to the table versus how long I had been on the team. Mm. And that was very influential. Um, I know in college I had some great, great teachers who just yeah. would always challenge my ideas and help me see things from a broader perspective. And then as a professional, I have like, I always meet great people and I consider myself a lifelong student I love learning. Yeah, I yeah. always have a stack of books. I'm always hungry to, to learn a new idea or to see a new concept or figure out something that could help myself and help other people. Um, I remember Deepak Chopra was a far away influence when I read The Seven Spiritual Laws yeah. of Success. That book Great totally book. rocked my world. Um, my yoga teacher who taught me about meditation when I was 17, she was huge. Mm. Uh, I've always loved Oprah ever oh since yeah. I was a little girl. She's so great. that was the far away. Who doesn't love Oprah? I mean, <laughs> anyone who doesn't, I'm just, I can't even deal with them. Yeah. I understand different strokes for different <laughs> folks, but the, the folks that are mean to her, I'm just, I don't yeah. even understand it. Yeah. Um, and of course, Tony Robbins, I oh remember man. he was my gateway drug really to the world of personal development. Mm -hmm. And I was so impressed with who he was. And uh, yeah, those are people that I feel like I've always kind of held in my heart and always 
looked to and admired and really appreciated the work that they do and who they are in the world. Yeah. Do you have any mentors or coaches right now that you work with on a daily basis or that you hire uh, you know, to support I you? I try and hire people in areas that I really need the help right now. Like where the business is at this moment, we have such a clear vision for where we want to go. It's Again, I sometimes I wish there were 48 hours in the yeah. day because there's so much that we want to do and I have to hold myself back so I don't work 17 you know, hours every single, mm-hmm. every single day. But um, for example, a lot's changing in the online world right now. A lot. And especially in the digital landscape and when you're selling digital learning products. One of the things that's changing are the tax laws, both in Europe and mm-hmm. here in the States. So for me, right now, what we're looking at investigating, uh, we're working with different tax attorneys because yeah. we want that expertise. Um, but I'm always talking with people if I have any challenge in the business, I look to go to someone who is a master in the area that I need specific advice in. So while it's not one person. It's a coach for the moment or for that season. Exactly. Depending on whatever the challenge or the opportunity is Mm -hmm. that I really want to leverage or make sure that we're ahead of the game, I try and find the best person that I think that can advise me based on their experience. Gotcha. Do you think it's valuable for people to have coaches in their life? Definitely. To either hire or unofficial mentors or something like that? I mean. I rely so much on my team and my friends and the people that I love that I think, you know, whether you want to call them a coach yeah. or, you know, depending on what vernacular kind of works Don't for you. Don't official, yeah. Yeah, but I, I do. And I think that, you know, there's nothing wrong with asking for help or saying, you know what, no one in my life really is willing to listen to me about the things that I want to talk about, the business I want to build. So I want someone who's totally focused on me, dedicated, can mm. help me get results. I think it's awesome. I've had that many times in my life. It's just at this particular moment, everything is so full. I feel like I've given myself enough homework, (laughs) you know what I mean, for the next six to eight months. But I do think they're valuable. Who gives you the best feedback of what's in the gap for you or what's missing or what's working and what's not working? Does anyone? You know, that's a really interesting question. Um, We're always listening to feedback in terms of, you know, if our customers have anything to share, like, hey, I think this is missing or... You know, if someone gives us yeah. any kind of criticism, we listen to everything, but I always try and pay attention, and so does the team, about, well, who's saying it, why? Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes people want things in business that you don't want to deliver. Yeah. You know, and oftentimes I've heard things, people like, oh, I wish you would do this, that, and that. And it's like, well, that's great if you want to <laughs> run that business. Sure. That's not the business I want to run. <laughs> exactly. Um, but in terms of feedback, in that sense, my f- I, the people I surround myself with are really honest. Yeah. Um, and if they ever notice me doing something that seems like it's a habit, or if they see something like, "Hey, Marie, I think you should keep an eye on this," people tell me. Okay. So. You so know. there's open communication with your team, with Always. Your family, and friends. With my and friends, yeah. everybody. That's cool. I think that's why our my friendships are always so tight because I cannot. I, I really don't have the ability to lie. Yeah. And if I'm pissed at someone or if something is not okay, I will just say it. Sure. I'll say this doesn't work for me or this happened doesn't feel good, and we literally we go through it, we get over it, and then we move on. Yeah. Would you say that's the reason you're able to stay so grounded, or how do you stay grounded with all that's going on? Huge business. Tons of customers, uh, people wanting to get your time and attention and yeah. emailing you. How yeah. do you stay grounded? Um, I don't know any other way to be. I mean, like, I'm from New Jersey. I know <laughs> that, like, this is all amazing and it's fun and it's awesome. But I also know that all of us are heading to the same destination yeah. death. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's true. And we don't know when that's going to come. I sincerely hope I make it to the time where I think <laughs> in like the 2030s or 2040s. Hopefully, medicine is going to come around and give us an ability to extend mm-hmm. a little bit more, which could be awesome or could be a nightmare. Um, who knows? <laughs> but um, but my point is this: it's like, you know, everybody poops, everybody farts. Ain't nobody better than anyone else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I try my very very best to honor and respect people. Yeah. I'm also a human being, so I can't pay attention to everything and all the time. And I think mm-hmm. one of the dangers in our society, especially for anyone who is a public figure in any kind of small sense Mm -hmm. or who has an audience that pays attention to them. You know, I know Gary V, who I love and adore and respect. And, you know, a lot of the things that he talks about always are always responding and always being there and always engaging. And again, I super respect him and I respect that. I'm not able to do that 24-7. I really need a lot of downtime. 
and I need a lot of time that's just disconnected. Yeah. And I hope people understand that because I care. I mm -hmm. super duper care, but sure. I can't be on Instagram 24 seven. I can't be on Facebook 24 seven. Can't I can't be, be on Twitter. Can't be texting or emailing. No, or, yeah. I, it would be a miserable life for me. Yeah. And I wouldn't want that for anyone. Yeah. So talk to me about vision. I've always had uh, big dreams, big visions, but they've shifted over the years. You know, when I was in college, I wanted to be a professional athlete. Uh, and then after that was over, I had to have a new vision. So what's your vision right now and what's the end game for you? So in terms of the vision right now, it's really about continuing to grow the company. And for us, it's, it's about impact. How can we change more lives? I think one of my gifts in this world is communication mm. and taking sometimes complex ideas and breaking them down into uh, simple, fun communication nuggets and different ways of teaching people things that don't feel overwhelming. Yeah. And I want to use that gift as much as possible. Um, so creating more products and learning programs that can really help people move the needle ahead in their own life. But more important for me, we really get on fire about our philanthropy component. I know you and I are both yep. really passionate about Pencils of Promise. Yeah. Um, we've got five schools with them right now. Amazing. We have a huge, thank you. <laughs> Amazing. We want to do more. Um, we just have this big partnership with an organization called Sama Source, and it helps lift women out of poverty by teaching them the skills that they need and professional skills to go mm. get dignified work. Um, we're doing a partnership with Save the Children USA because there's all this research that says if you want to take care of poverty, one of the most research-backed, effective ways to do that is through early childhood mm. education. And if you can get the moms and get the kids right from birth up until five, the results are dramatic in terms of the fact that they'll stay in school yeah. um, and just the trickle up effects of how positive that can be. So we're looking at all of the different ways that we can use not only our financial resources but our community resources to drive awareness and action to making the world a better place. You know, there's something that I learned from uh, Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wudun, authors of Half the Sky and A Path Appears. Uh -huh. And I read this little phrase in their book and it really hit home for me that uh, talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And So how do we make opportunity universal? Well, that's what we're working on. Yeah. That's the game plan. I mean, with providing education to kids and uh, mm. Save the Children, the Early Childhood, uh, Early Steps Initiative here in the States, we've funded scholarships. I'm constantly looking at ways to help people have that opportunity to create a better life for themselves. Because mm. I started realizing, you know, especially in the personal development world, I was finding myself getting really, really upset and mm. really pissed off. About what? About people throwing around phrases like, you know, oh, if you can just think your way into it <laughs> and you can, you know, create this wealth and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And uh, quite honestly, there are some phrases that earlier on in my career that I said and I believed. And it wasn't until I really started to investigate the state of our planet and the state of humanity mm. and how many people are living on less than a dollar twenty-five a day. It's not about these people not having mm. the right consciousness. Yeah. It's the fact they can think all they want. And there is so <coughs> much talent that is underutilized yeah. because so many of our fellow human beings, they don't even have the basic necessities. Yeah. No clean water, no access to health care, no nutrition, no safety. And I mean you and I both know the stats about women yeah. and how in so many parts of the world they're treated not even like human beings, yeah. like things. That woke me up and got me so fired up to say, well, what can I do to help change this? Mm. And to really start unpacking all the different opportunities that we have. Uh, and I consider, you know, people like you and I, many, perhaps not all the people listening to this podcast today, We've won what Warren Buffett calls the ovarian lottery. Mm. Sheer chance, right, that you and I were born in this country. Yes. And I know many of us have had rough childhoods. We may not have had the easiest roads. However, compared to right. some of the folks who are sharing the planet with us at this very day and time who have nothing, yeah. no access to clean water, no access to and shelter. no rights. No rights. Yeah. It's like... That, for me, that whole yeah. idea that talent is universal but opportunity is not, that's why when I started to kind of see things floating around in the personal development or transformational yeah. world, they're about, well, they just need to, as like, no. you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. We have there's other hurdles. There's huge other hurdles. Yeah. And I think that in order for us to truly live the fullness of our potential, it can't just be about us. 
And it can't just be about how big is our business going to get or how many people in our <coughs> audience or any of that stuff. Um, it can't be. There's no real meaning in that. Yeah. And the things that mean the most to us and the things that mean the most to me in terms of vision and where we're going is how can I continue to create more and more impact? How can I continue to get people on board with these ideas and these opportunities to make a difference in a real substantial way. Mm. Why are you so driven to make a big impact in the world and in people's lives? And why is living a life of service such an important thing for all of us to think about and be doing? I don't think there's anything else that's quite as meaningful. Mm. I mean, f in my own experience, Ever since I was a little girl, I have known that I'm supposed to do something to help others. I didn't really know how that was supposed to look. Or what. What that meant. But, you know, as you get older and as you get more experience and as you get exposed to more of the world, you just start to see things. And I think one of the challenges with people in the West and, you know, people that, again, have won the ovarian lottery, we get so self, like, sucked up in our, our own crap that's, yeah. like, nothing compared yeah. to these other human beings that are just like us. And no one gives a shit. Yeah. And it's like, if we're not going to care, who is? We can't rely on the government. We can't rely on somebody else. It's up to us to make these yeah. changes. So I don't know where that comes from, but... For me, it's always been a part of who I am, and the more that I learn, the more that I want to do. <coughs> For someone that doesn't feel like they're where they want to be yep. in their career, or their finances, their relationships, um, and isn't living a life of service, maybe isn't giving their time, isn't um, donating any money, or being a part of something to give back, yep. do you feel like that's probably one of the major factors in their success, or in people's success, is if they live a life of service or have a mindset of service? I think that it can really help all of us. Yeah. You know, I know when I first started to get involved in work like this, um, I used to open my checkbook and want to cry because there wasn't <laughs> a lot in there. I was terrified it's, it's of it. It's scary sometimes. Scary. And I remember the first time that I committed, and again, like you said, you know, writing checks and giving money, that's not the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, using your voice using social media, yeah. reading about it, contributing your idea capital or your time or just your humanity yeah. um, to another human being. Like those are extremely important as well. But I remember the first time that I committed a substantial amount of money, I didn't have that money yet. But I knew that the only way that I was going to out train or outsmart my scarcity mindset, because I didn't grow up with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. My mom grew up in poverty. so. I grew up with messages around money that there was never enough yep. and that it, money was, doesn't grow on trees. it was scarce <laughs> and like all yeah. I remember, my parents actually got divorced over a lack of uh. money. So I associated um, not having enough money with pain, a ton of pain mm. and losing love. And I made a decision when I was eight, I said, I'm going to grow up and make enough so that it never takes away love again. Yeah. And I remember when I started noticing those same kind of bad money ideas in my head popping up and I looked at my checkbook and I, it was horrible. There's not enough in there. And mm. I said, I need to do this because I know my internal truth says there's always more where that came from in terms of money, but I'm not living that yet. So I need to start acting what I know to be true, even though my mind is terrified. Mm. And um, it was this first commitment, and I wound up donating a couple of thousand dollars to an organization called Girl Up. It was a UN Foundation initiative about empowering the 600 million adolescent girls throughout the developing world that get married off, forced into marriage wow. by the time they're like 8 to 12. They are pregnant 12 to 13. Sometimes they get HIV. They don't even make it sometimes to 18. I mean, it's horrendous. Anyway. I wound up donating um, this amount of money. There was a ceremony. And when I had got off of stage with that ceremony, a person from Richard Branson's team was in the audience and was very um, interested in my story and who I was and what I was doing. And that's how I wound up getting to meet Richard and spending yeah. time with him in South Africa. So when you come to this question of is giving back or being of service or having that mindset, could that help you? I know it helped me. It yeah. helped me in so many ways. It helped train me out of the ideas of scarcity. It mm -hmm. helped teach me what I'm capable of. It helped me know that I am so much more than my thoughts. Um, and I think it does change people's lives in very, very profound ways. And it's a great place to look. Yeah. You mentioned how uh, you know money and has created a lot of pain for you with relationships and potentially losing love yes. without having enough money. Yes. 
So can we talk about love and relationships and vision yeah. for a second? Yeah. Because I've asked this question to a lot of uh, big male leaders yeah. and asked them, do they think it's possible to have, to live a huge vision and be going after inspiring the whole war world, giving back, doing everything they're doing, and have a meaningful, intimate, loving relationship or marriage? Yep. And do you think it's possible to live such a big mission in life and have a successful, I guess, quote unquote, successful, meaningful relationship as well? So it's an interesting question. And I think, A, yes, it is possible. But here's the thing. I think you almost have to separate the two. And mm. here's why. Mm. When you look at relationship in life and, and love relationships and intimacy, no matter what you're doing in the world, you know, whether you've got some big mission or business or vision or you're constantly traveling, or you happen to have a life that's very simple and you know, you like that life, you love that life, you're working set hours, you don't have a big mortgage, you know what I mean? It's yeah, just yeah. simple. There's always gonna be challenges in relationships because human beings are complex. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you almost have to look at them a little bit differently okay. and know that A, every relationship is not meant to last and because a relationship ends doesn't mean it failed. You know, when a relationship comes to an end, it might mean that you've come together, you've learned all you can possibly learn from one another, and it's actually time for both of you to move on. Wow. For me, that doesn't mean that it was a failure. It just means you're on to your next adventure. So that's that little piece of it. Oh yeah, I like and that. every single relationship has a beginning, middle, and an end. And how we each define success is so different. Yeah. You know, is a relationship successful if you stay together 65 years but you don't have sex, there's no intimacy and you kind of hate each other? Or is a relationship successful if you've only been together for a year and it's been dynamic and beautiful but you've outgrown each other and you're ready to move on? Mm. What makes a relationship successful? So I think there's a lot to unpack there. Hmm. And yeah. I think being willing to challenge the definition of success and also being willing to define that for yourself is really, really vital. And then in terms of the challenges that come when you have two busy people, yeah. when there's people going around and there's lots of travel, I think, again, it's about how do you co-create what you define to be a successful relationship mm. with your individual partner? There's going to be some people who love spending that much time apart because you know what? Absence makes the heart grow fonder, yeah. so they don't mind it. Yeah. And there's gonna be other people who find that, I can't tolerate it, I've gotta be with <laughs> you 24 seven, this is yeah. never gonna work. So that's why I think that um, it's really important not to just lump everything together sure, sure. and to take a little bit more of an investigative approach and that be willing to define your version of relationship success. Like for me, you know, Josh, uh, who I love so much, He's an actor. There's points in his career where he's traveling all over the place. He's working like super early in the morning and it goes into a night shoot mm -hmm. and we could be like ships passing in the night. Yeah. And for us it works because we understand and love each other in such a way where we get what we signed up for. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I get it, yeah. And that doesn't mean that we don't have our own little things from time to time, but we're committed to working it out and we're committed to each other. And we've often, I always say this, and it's like our relationship is not gonna last forever. You know, yeah. either we're gonna part at some point or he's gonna die or I'm gonna die or both of us gonna die. Like, it's not gonna last forever. Yeah. None of them are. So how can you have as much fun as possible in the meantime? I saw a quote online, someone said the other day, that said, uh, the scary thing about relationships is you're either gonna break up or you're gonna get married. There's one of two things that can happen. <laughs> you either it either ends or you get married. And both right. of those are terrifying for some people. Yeah. Does it have to be painful when it ends? Because you said it's always going to end. Yeah. Does it have to be painful? And how does someone navigate through the end of a relationship? You know, I think that we're human beings yeah. and sadness and heartbreak are, um, they're tough. But it can be a good thing too. Well, it can be bittersweet. Yeah. I mean, I think we've all had our heart broken. We've yeah. all been in places where a relationship has come to an end and we didn't want it or they didn't want it and you feel guilty. You know, there's so many different variations of that where it's certainly not comfortable. It's not easy. Um, did you ask how can it, how can we navigate that? Yeah. You know, I think the whole key to navigating any sort of emotional pain is A, you've got to admit that it's there and not try and be beyond it already. Mm -hmm. And also on the flip side, not overindulge and get so dramatic. Yeah. Where you're like, I'm going to die. You're not going <laughs> to die. You're going to be fine. 
but I think giving yourself permission to actually feel the full range of yeah. sadness, of loneliness, of heartbreak, letting yourself cry, letting yourself actually process those very real emotions. Mm -hmm. And then when you're ready to say, okay, what's next for me? What do I want? Do I want some time by myself? Yeah. Do I want to experience different people, meaning just have friendships and maybe more, but I mm -hmm. want to just give myself some space. And I think taking control of that consciousness and knowing we came into this earth by ourselves, we're going to likely leave by ourselves, and whatever happens in between, how can you bring as much grace and love and mm. humility yeah. and openness to it as possible? I think it's the best chance we got. Yeah, I like that answer. You have such an incredible brand. You have such an incredible business. Uh, the content you put out there is so on point. Thank you. And it's so fun, and it's, per and it's got your personality. Is there anything that you are struggling with that maybe your audience or the world doesn't know about that might surprise people? I think the thing that I struggle with the most is having so many things that I want to create and put out into the world mm -hmm. and never feeling like I can do it fast enough. Like I always have to check myself, mm -hmm. always have to check myself of like, Gosh, I want that done yesterday. <laughs> like, I wish all five of these things were created two years ago. Sure? And matching that with the reality of, like, time, space, continuum, mm -hmm. <laughs> the fact that I'm one person, and also enough experience in business to know I know how to do things right, mm -hmm. which is, you know, thank you, by the way, for everything that you shared. Yeah. And in terms of putting out great content and creating great programs and everything that we do, mm -hmm. the reason that most people have that experience is because we do take our time. Yeah. And because we're not it. slapping things together mm -hmm. and because we're not willy nilly and just trying to get something out the door. So for me, the struggle is always an internal one of how can I grow? How can I create faster? How can I make these things happen and not beat myself up that I'm not there yet? What would you say uh, are the top two or three things that are necessary to have a successful business online or even offline. Again, you said you take the time uh, to do things to make it really well. One of the things that I talk about with in regards to what you do really well with other people, I always refer you, is that you're so consistent. And for the last four years since I've known you, it's like you've done the same thing every week for the last four years. Marie TV, you know it's coming out every week. You got one product launch that comes out every year at the same time. Yep. Consistency is what I would say is one thing that you do really well, but what are maybe two or three things that are the key to running a very successful business? Great question, mm -hmm. and I, I will back this up with uh, one thing that sometimes people don't realize about me because they've sort of gotten to know me over these past uh -huh. four years is that previous to you know B-School every year and previous to Marie TV, I had like a whole library of information products, uh -huh. and some of them were physical, and I did a live event and a mentorship program. Yeah, dating and had, book. And I mean, yeah. all this other stuff, and we really went through the simplification process, which helped a lot mm. with consistency. But in terms of other things, um, I think really finding the right people oh around gosh. you. So important. Even if it's one person, you know, one assistant or one team player that gets the culture of your company, that is on yeah. board with your vision, what you stand for, that is excited to help you bring it to life. I think, you know, none of us can do anything that we do on our own and we really need to find strong team players. Mm. And it takes a while. This isn't easy. I yeah. wish there was like two simple tips. <laughs> Everyone would do them. Yeah. But um <laughs> Finding the right people on your team, I yeah. think that's really, really huge. In terms of other things, and that's something you can kind of control and not control yeah. to a certain degree. You can control it in the sense of you can take actions and keep searching for that person, but you can't make them show up any yeah. faster than they show up. It took me about four years to really find the team that I feel like, okay, now we're grooving. Yep. Of hiring, firing, testing, trying people out. You know, it takes three to six months. I'm like, oh, it's not working. Yep. And it's a challenge sometimes. Yep. But I think that's one of the key things for sure is having the team. So thanks for sharing that. Yep. Having the team. I also think being really clear, you know, when you talk about, well, what can someone do to make sure they have a successful online or offline business? As much as you can clarify your vision of mm. what success looks like to you. Sure. So don't worry about what success looks like for Lewis Howes or Marie Forleo or anyone else that you might admire. I think it's really about how do you define success? You know, yeah. one of my first uh, benchmarks was, oh my goodness, I just want to have a $100,000 business. That was more money sure. than I could ever imagine making, and it felt so far away. How was I going to do that? But I knew that was one of the criteria, yeah. and I also knew um, that I wanted my products to 
you know, feel a certain way with my customers. I wanted them to be so delighted and surprised mm -hmm. and just feel like they got 10 times whatever sure. value they invested. So the second thing would be knowing your vision of success, even if it's just 12 months out, even if it's 18 months out. Yeah. Can you define what that looks like for you so that you can get some team player on board who wants to go in the same direction that you want to yeah. go? Um, in terms of your customer experience, how do you want your customers to experience your product or your brand? And really defining that. Mm -hmm. What are the words that describe the feelings that they're going to feel when they experience what you do? Mm -hmm. How do you want them to talk about you in the world? How, you know, all of these things to kind of really start defining that experience. I think a lot of us can get so wrapped up in what we think our product should be yeah. or um, what we want to create without thinking of what's the impact we want to have on that other person we're, th we're here to serve. And what do you want people to say about you and your products? I want them to have tangible results in their lives, meaning like they've watched a Marie TV episode, they've done B-School, they've interacted with any other of our, our programs that are going to be coming out, which yeah. is exciting, <laughs> um, and really go, that moved the needle ahead for me. I huh. created X, Y, and Z, and I also want them to feel loved and taken care of. We go to such great lengths to have people feel safe, yeah. to let them know we're not here like just to take their money, <coughs> that sure. we're so invested in creating outstanding educational products that create outrageous results in people's lives and that they have fun doing them. So if I can make them laugh along the way yeah. and have them <laughs> have a good do time, a lot of the time, thank <laughs> you, then I feel like I've done my job. A couple of final questions. One that came up for me just when you were speaking about that is comparing yourself with other people. Yeah. And I think, you know, I do this and I know a lot of people that I coach, they're going through my programs, they're always comparing well. Marie's got a YouTube show, so I should have a YouTube show. Sure. Or they've got a podcast, so I need to launch a podcast. Yep. It's always comparing. How do we get out of the comparison game, and how do we focus on knowing when to uh, adopt someone else's strategies to our own, sure. but also not saying I've got to compare myself or I'm not making the type of money they're making, so I'm not good enough. Like, How do we navigate that? So um, this is funny. We did a Marie TV on this not so long ago, and I likened it to in college. I remember um, I was quite a bit of a party girl in college. And really? Oh, yeah. I can't at, see that. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I remember you like to dance what? I like to dance, and I, I didn't drink at all in yeah. high school, but in college I just was like, well, this is what you do in college. Sure. And I remember there was this nasty drink called Goldschlager. Huh. And I don't know if you know what this uh, this it's terrible. It is so disgusting. It's like, like a Jaeger bomb or something. It's or? like syrupy liquidy and it oh. had like like these gold flickers in it. Oh. It was so nasty. Mm. Anyway, I liken comparing yourself to other people like doing shots of compare schlager. You ain't <laughs> ever gonna feel good. It's disgusting. Right, you know right. what I mean? You pour that bottle, you take a shot, you're basically wiping yourself out oh. for at least a day, if not two days, if not a week. Or if you go far enough down the hole and you're like just drank the whole bottle, mm. you'll do something like what you said. Say, oh, they've got a show or they've got a podcast. I'm going to do that. And then six months later, you're like, what the hell am I doing? Yeah. This isn't even what I want to be doing. You lose your identity. Completely. Mm -hmm. So you got to put down the bottle of com compare slugger. Like mm. just don't even pick <laughs> like it up. That. you got to go cold turkey, which means if you're following certain people and you know that somehow you get triggered into comparison by that person, even if that person is mm -hmm. amazing, Stop following them. Yeah. Take them off your Twitter stream. Yeah, interesting. Take them off your Facebook. Hmm. It's like, why are you going to tempt yourself? Yeah. Stay focused on what you want. And I think it comes back to what we shared before. If you have a clear vision for what success looks like to you, that's not completely influenced by all these other people you're comparing yourself to, it's so much easier to stay in your own yeah. game. Yeah. Stay in your own game. You got to just stop it cold turkey. And you know it. Everybody knows it. You can feel the finger going on the computer, like when you're about to go type in something that you know <laughs> is like doing a shot, right? Yeah. And even if it pops up in your feed, you didn't look for it, but it shows up, it's li you have to treat yourself like an addict. And you have to shut mm. it down immediately and like go work on your own thing. Yeah. I like that. Before I ask you the final two questions, yep. simple questions, I want to just take a moment to acknowledge your incredible gifts because I don't think you get acknowledged enough. Aww. And I know you are just so committed to giving to the world. And I want to acknowledge you for being consistent and putting yourself on the line every week, putting yourself out there to criticism and to people trying to bring you down or whatever <laughs> it may be, but you've just done an incredible job since I've known you over the yeah. last four years. And I want to acknowledge you for having a huge heart, giving back, and just loving every step along the way. Oh. It's so refreshing and amazing, and I appreciate you for that. 
Thanks, Lois. Yeah, of course. Oh, that was great. <laughs> Hugging yeah. on, Lois. Uh, what are you most grateful for right now is the second to last question. Second to last question. I, I'm really, I'm grateful for everything. I know it's, it can sound so friggin' trite, but I know this morning I was sitting there, and Josh was in bed and I had mm. Kuma, my little dog. I love your dog. And he, like, we're sitting there, we're drinking tea, and I'd just gotten back because I had a blowout because I knew we were hanging out today, uh -huh. and you know, I love me my blowouts. <laughs> and I was just it was like, great, by the way. thank you. <laughs> and, um, and, and hair is real. I can't even tell you how many times people, they just like. Really? They ask for um, extensions? Well, you don't even know. I have friends of friends. I just got to tell you this because it's really funny. Sure. Really good friend of mine, her sister watches the show and uh -huh. is like, you got to tell Marie, she's doing an amazing job, but I have to say something. Tell her the extensions lately, they're just a little too much. And my friend was like, Th that's actually her hair, dude. Like it's, I know her. Can it's I feel it hair. to make sure? You can. You okay. can pull. You can pull on it. Wow. You I don't feel it. anything in there. No. no. It's, wow. It's, no, it's really nice. It, I'm Italian. Yeah. I, I mean, I, got, I have, I, I have thick. hairy arms. Like yeah. don't, don't hate on me because of this. Because you know, the, yeah. the, a lot of hair goes. A lot of shaving <laughs> needs to happen. Anyway. Um, I really am grateful for everything. Like this morning when I was sitting there with Josh and Kuma and having my mate and thinking I would get to see you because yeah. I haven't seen you in a while, and just really grateful to be alive and so happy that way back in that day when I thought about mm. being a life coach and it sounded corny to myself. I was rolling my eyes at myself. I was like, who the hell is going to hire a 23 year old life coach? Yeah. So grateful that I made that decision back then. Mm. I, when I meditate, I do kind of do a round of gratitude. <laughs> Sure. I go around in a circle and for my parents and my brother and my team oh. and everybody in my life and I, I try and like ping out gratitude to all the people I can think of mm. and then extend it to our larger audience and extend it to all the people in the world. I do that often because I just feel incredibly um, fortunate and that's part of the reason why I want to help other people because I, I do feel really blessed. And I feel that it's my responsibility that if I have this gift of communication, whether people find me annoying or they find me entertaining, and I have an ability to teach and, and to lead, that I need to use this while I'm here. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here, hopefully yeah. for a really long time, but I want to squeeze every single drop yeah. out of my life as I can. So yeah. those are That's cool. pretty much everything. And we don't know when our last moment is. No. Final question. Yes. It's what is your definition of greatness? My <laughs> definition of greatness is showing up in every single moment like you're meant to be there. Mm. And also that you're willing to listen to the call of your soul and speak from that place in every moment, that you don't back down, that you use your voice, that you stand up for what you believe in and that you live to the fullest of your potential as best as you possibly can every single day. Marie Forleo, thanks for coming on. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you so much.